V-Day represented an end to the fighting in Europe and the defeat of Nazism. The desperate attempts of Nazi Germany to employ technology to turn the tide of Allied power, and had the war persisted for longer, this would have come to define how we remember the Second World War. But they failed in the face of the Allied citizens' willingness to endure, coupled with cutting-edge British technology. Let's take a look at some of those innovations on both sides of the conflict. The Hawker Tempest was a late Second World War fighter, and by April 1944 it had entered service. By VE Day, it had made a crucial contribution to the defeat of Germany. With its low altitude performance and speed, it helped defeat the final major threat to Britain, the V-1 flying bomb. In June 1944, the German V-weapon offensive began when V-1s were launched against London. With an average speed of close to 350 miles per hour and carrying 850 kilograms of explosives, these weapons presented a major threat to the UK. And the best defence that the RAF had available against this threat was the Hawker Tempest. When the first V-1 was launched on the 13th of June, there were less than 30 operational Tempests in the RAF. This small number became a critical part in the air defence of Great Britain. At the outset of the offensive, up to 150 V-1s a day were being fired across the English Channel. By the 16th of June, the Tempest squadrons had brought down their first V-1. And by September, the Tempest pilots had destroyed over 630 of these deadly missiles. The Tempest represents an evolution of aircraft design, remedying some of the problems that were found on Hawker's more famous fighter, the Typhoon. The Tempest was not a radical leap forward. It was the careful employment of technological advancements, and it arrived in time and in numbers for the air defence of Great Britain. And it remained in RAF service until 1951. In 1944, the Luftwaffe realised there was a pressing need for a mass-produced jet fighter. The type, however, needed to utilise materials and production facilities not already in use. The aircraft would also have to be relatively easy to fly, allowing for it to be flown by undertrained Hitler Youth, earning it the moniker Volksjäger, the People's Fighter. To a large extent, the design represents the need for simplicity in the production process. For instance, the nose could be formed from moulded plywood, the jet engine was attached directly above the wing and mounted with only three bolts. And this greatly simplified maintenance in the field and protected the engine in the event of a crash landing. When testing, the aircraft was found to be very unstable. So winglets were added to help for stability. This technique continues to be employed on aircraft today. The HE-162 was produced primarily for economic rather than technical reasons. It was designed with the production aim of maximizing coerced and slave labor which typified the German war economy in the final 12 months of the war. Only a small number of HE-162s have survived, and the RF Museum is one of only half a dozen in the world to have an example on public display. The Gloucester Meteor was Britain's first operational jet aircraft. It was successful because it was based on an evolved airframe design and had a radical new technology, the jet engine. The Meteor was rushed into service to help defend against the V1s, but it was only available in small numbers. And still working up to operational efficiency, it made only a modest contribution. It wasn't until January 1945 that the type was considered fully ready for operations and was able to join the Allied forces in the liberation of Europe. And by VE Day, two squadrons were in service in Northwest Europe. Had the war continued, the Meteor would have appeared in increasing numbers, and it would have been joined by a more radical design, the de Havilland Vampire. These types were part of the technological arms race, and they were being developed to counter a real and emerging threat shortly before the Allied victory. The V-2 was a guided ballistic missile capable of striking Britain at long range. It could fly at over 3,500 miles per hour and had a warhead of 1,000 kilograms. Its speed meant the V-2 could only be defeated on the ground, with airstrikes on launch sites and the rail system being used to transport the weapon. Germany launched the first V-2 in September 1944. Some 6,000 V-2s were manufactured, but air attacks and misfires reduced the number of successful launches to around 3,000. Of these, over 1,000 exploded in Britain, of which 500 struck London. Britain launched Operation Backfire. With no complete surviving examples of the V-2, captured components from around Germany were assembled. Britain already understood the destruction this weapon could inflict from repeated attacks, now they had a chance to understand the V2 from the other side. 
The Allies realised that if they were combined with atomic weapons, ballistic missiles were an immensely powerful weapon. The ME-262 was a twin jet engine fighter. It saw active combat and it was armed with 30mm cannon designed to destroy heavy bombers. The ME-262 design included a swept wing, which was introduced because its engines otherwise shifted the centre of gravity too far forward. Although this change provided the aircraft with a more efficient aerodynamic design than the Meteor, had the war continued, the British designs would have prevented them gaining air superiority. The Meteor and the Vampire combined high performance technology with established airframe principles, had better designs for maintenance and far superior engine life. The ME-262 and HE-162 may appear more glamorous, but the British types were winners designed for the battlefield. For the RAF in particular, VE Day marked the end of one war in Europe and the dawning of another.